Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the East Riding of Yorkshire series. Together with the unparished city of Hull, it forms the county of the same name. There's 172 parishes here. Which one are we in today? Hello folks, welcome back to the East Riding of Yorkshire once again. And for the last time, we're on the western side of the county. I've come mob-handed to this place. It's a, a big town. Hello, Nikki. Hello. Hello. Hello, Lauren. Yeah. They're all going to be following me around this place. And Hannah is here too, but... Doesn't want to be on camera. Camera shy one, as always. This is the beautiful town of Pocklington. Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Pocklington, town of Pockles people. Oh, how I've been looking forward to this one. Welcome folks for the last time to the western side of the East Riding of Yorkshire as we take on the market town of Pocklington, both an ancient place and still extremely important in the modern age. It sits at the foot of the Yorkshire Wold, some 30 miles east of York and 22 miles northwest of Hull. Pocklington gets its name from Old English and it literally means Town of Pockles People. It's a name that can be traced back all the way to 650 AD, but it's been around since the Bronze Age. It's one of the settlements that appears on the 14th century Goth map, the oldest route map in Great Britain. Pocklington developed through the Middle Ages while many similar places fell into dramatic decline. It owed much of its prosperity to local trade. Wool was England's main export at that time, and Pocklington benefited greatly from being on the main road to York, an important national centre for its export to the continent. By the time of Doomsday, it was the second largest settlement in Yorkshire after York itself. Although now a relatively small town in comparison to most, Pock, as it's known to the locals, punches well above its weight in terms of history, and landmarks are plentiful. So, without further ado, let's get walking and check some of them out. We start our walk at West Green Car Park, which is built on part of the former York to Beverley railway line. We've met this line loads of times before, most notably in Stamford Bridge, where we crossed an old railway viaduct. The line served Pocklington from 1847 until its closure in 1965. This footpath follows its route northwest towards Barnby Road. Pocklington had a station, and part of it now forms the sports hall of one of the local schools. That would be Pocklington School, and from this path you can see some of its other buildings. We'll be ending there later. Pocklington is full of all the amenities you'd expect from a small town. That said, on Barnby Road, there isn't a lot apart from housing. Where it meets George Street, though, there's both a dentist and a petrol station. On George Street itself is one of the town's most iconic buildings, the old courthouse. 
This still houses the police station, but it heard its last court session in 2001. It was converted in 2006 to accommodate both Pocklington Town Council and the East Riding of Yorkshire Council. And one member of our little team thought it could use an interesting addition. So according to our Lauren, the police station would look a lot better if it had what outside it? A TARDIS. Because the TARDIS, its chameleon circuit, put it as a police public call box. And it's a police station, so it'd make sense and it would look good. Can you tell Lauren's a Doctor Who fan, anybody? <laughs> We're making our way towards the church next, primarily, but in doing so we have to walk through a residential area. This is Kirkgate, which is loaded with three-storey high council flats. These aren't typical of the accommodation you find in Pocklington generally, as you'll soon see. They do, though, lead us onto Chapman Gate, where we find a former congregational chapel, now the Assembly of God Pentecostal Church. Originally built in 1806, this was given its gorgeous classical facade in 1879 by the architect T.B. Thompson. He was very active in building dissenting chapels, but practiced mainly in Hull. Turning onto Pem Lane, we get our first look at the Tower of All Saints Church, still as imposing as ever, despite the early morning mist. Also down here is the United Services Club, which used to be the Waterloo Hotel. Buildings at its rear were once used for the brewing of beer. So let's head into the churchyard. All Saints Church is known locally as the Cathedral of the Wolds. It's an important Grade 1 listed building, dating mainly from the 12th to the 15th century. Ecclesiastically, Pocklington is a constituent parish of the Diocese of York. The church clock dating from 1841 has an unusual mechanism in that it only uses one train to strike the hours and chime the quarter hours. Only one other church clock with a similar mechanism is known, that of St John's Church in Keswick, Cumbria. It was restored in 2004. It's likely that the missionary St Paulinus established the first Christian church in Pocklington on his way from Goodmanham to found York Minster. The building's foundations go back to the Saxon era and some fragments remain of a former Norman church. This one was open, so let's have a little look around inside. Well, this is certainly one of those churches that you don't really know where to look first. There's loads to look at on the walls. I'd be here all day if I tried to show you everything that's on the walls. This is the view from, I suppose, an altar. It's not the altar, I don't think, because obviously there's one behind me. As you can see, there's no pews. There's no wooden pews. It's all chairs in the, uh, the nave there. It's quite a tall church as well. I tilt the camera up, which you see how high it is, how much room there is up there. So yeah, that's the church here in Pocklington. Let's keep going because there's plenty more to cover yet. Outside in the churchyard stands the Sotheby Cross. The Sotheby's can be traced back to Roger of Lincoln, born in 1302. They give their name to the famous international auctioneers of fine art. They came to Pocklington in about 1380 and John Sotheby was born in Pocklington in 1390. This cross was made in his memory. Speaking of memorials, you don't need to go far to find another. On Great Lane opposite the church is the Garden of Remembrance, which features Pocklington's World War II memorial. The town has a separate memorial for World War I. Now we're back to West Green and in front of us here is the Library and Customer Services Centre. This also has a different name, the Porcelain Centre, which is a direct reference to the town's name. Pocklington is the town of Pockel or Porcelain's people. From here we head up Railway Street and onto Pavement to find the first of many pubs. This is the Station Hotel, but originally it was the New Red Lion. It was also named the Dog and Duck for a brief period. It became the Station Hotel because it once catered for a large number of people who arrived via the railway to stay in the town. Now we're in the marketplace, the centre of Pocklington, where a sign greets us with a bit of complimentary history. 
There are way too many landmarks and buildings in this one to cover them all, but as we make our way through the centre, we'll highlight a couple. First of all, we have the Black Bull. This was known as a cockfighting inn back in the day, but more importantly, it was in this very building where the first public meeting was held to decide on the building of the Pocklington Canal. That was in 1801, and of course, we've met the old canal itself a few times in other episodes. Next door is Pocklington Art Centre, which was formerly the Oak House Cinema. This opened in the year 2000 and offers a mixed programme of film, music, drama and exhibitions. The TV presenter Victoria Corrin Mitchell once used the name of the Pocklington Art Centre for her Ormerod hoax. Although it looks a bit weather-worn, this monument commemorates the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. Its existence is thanks to Thomas Robson, born at Full Sutton in 1855. He was a solicitor and served Pocklington on many fronts, and was chairman of the Diamond Jubilee Committee. Next up is the Feathers Hotel, probably the oldest inn in Pocklington. In Victorian times, the Feathers was used for political gatherings and society meetings. It's supposedly haunted by the ghost of a lady called Charlotte, who died on the premises after an encounter with a highwayman. Now, even though Pocklington has several shops, including this co-op and a couple of national supermarkets, it originated as a market town, and it still holds a market today. It's held on a Tuesday, and when it is, the marketplace is closed. Here's the sign to prove it. Pocklington's market charter was granted by King Edward I in 1299. Let's go up Market Street now, where in a moment we'll run into Smithy Hill. That's the area directly in front of the post office. Pocklington's original post office on Railway Street opened in 1904, and it's now a restaurant. In front of the modern post office is the World War I Memorial. This is known to the locals as the Pocklington Cross, and it was unveiled on the 20th of November 1921. It's a stone cross surmounting a tapering column, and it displays a total of 60 names. It's a Grade 2 listed structure. Coming to the end of Market Street now, we have the Cross Keys. This inn was named as such because of its proximity to the manor of the Dean of York, and it's probably situated on land owned by that self-same manor. Other than that, very little is known about this particular pub. There's so much stuff in the town centre, and trust me, it's not just all about Market Street. There are loads of little alleyways and ginnels off it with little hidden shops and things like that that you wouldn't even know are there. But, you know, I can't cover it all. I've got to keep to keep to this route. It's a long old route, so we need to carry on. Now, when we reach the end of Market Street, there's a junction just here. I'm just going to briefly turn left because there's a chapel I want to catch that way. And then we're going that way along Chapman Gate next. The chapel in question is the former Wesleyan Methodist building, and it was constructed in 1864. It replaced an original Wesleyan chapel, which was built in 1813 on the same site. It's a handsome structure of red brick with stone dressings in the Grecian style. It's still in use today as a Methodist chapel. We're in an area now which has lots of schools, but a couple of them are not on this route. To the north of Chapman Gate is Pocklington Junior School on School Lane, and its associated infant school isn't far away. There's also a Roman Catholic school too on Maxwell Road. Now we're on Bridge Street and below us is Pocklington Beck. This is the largest watercourse in the town and it runs underneath the town centre. We're on what's known as London Bridge. The Beck once served lots of corn mills further upstream and downstream, but all have long since disappeared. On the next corner is a Roman Catholic church dedicated to St Mary and St Joseph. This Gothic Revival brick building was completed in 1863 by the architect Matthew Ellison Hadfield from Sheffield. A Catholic community has existed in Pocklington since at least the year 1790. London Street now, where we pass the yard of local carpenters and joiners Chapman and Craddock. 
Just beyond this is a sign which points you in the direction of many of the well-known Wolds walking trails, but they will all take us out of Pocklington. Onward therefore. The next landmark is Lyndhurst Private Day Nursery. Originally a large private house, this was where Pocklington Preparatory School was sited before it moved in 1992 into the campus of Pocklington School. After this it's mostly residential, save for a pizza takeaway and this, the Battle Flats Veterinary Clinic. Speaking of schools, we now come to Waldgate. This is a co-educational secondary school in sixth form on Kinnick Road, which has approximately 1,100 pupils aged between 11 and 18. Until 2017, the school was local authority funded, but now it's an academy and part of a multi-learning partnership. Waldgate School was originally built in the 1950s. Notable former pupils include the musician Findlay Brown, the wildlife artist Robert E. Fuller, and footballers Nick Culkin and Michael Woods, the latter of whom once played for Chelsea. After walking through some residential areas, we're on Burnby Lane now at Pocklington Rugby Union Football Club. The town has a long history with the Oval Ball. The first rugby match in Pocklington was held on West Green in 1879. It was played between Pocklington Town and District and Pocklington Grammar School. The current club, formed in 1928, hosts the traditional Good Friday Sevens tournament, which is the longest established competition of its type in Yorkshire. It launched in 1958 and it's often seen as Pocklington's premier sporting event. From sport to healthcare next as we come to Pocklington Ambulance Station on Wold Garth. Wold Garth itself is a care complex. It was built in 1971 and consists of 20 bungalows, each with the capacity to cater for just one resident. There are more care facilities around the back of these buildings though, thanks to the Wold Haven Resource Centre. This can cater for up to 43 people, some of whom may be living with dementia. It's divided into two units. One unit has 36 bedrooms and the other has six. After passing the Scout Hut, we find ourselves at the Francis Scaife Leisure Centre, which includes a 20 metre swimming pool and a gym. The Scaifes were a long established Pockington family that carried out a variety of trades and professions in the town. Francis Scaife's branch of the family were brewers. Next door is the Cricket Club, which was formed in 1850 and it's still going strong today. Their most famous player was Alan Siddle. He was a farmer by trade, but also a professional cricketer during the last 20 years of the 19th century. Well populated with bird life, behind the cricket ground is Primrose Wood, popular with the local residents. A public footpath passes within the site's northwest boundary, which is also a spur off the Wolds Way. Now the locals will tell you there was once a historic well within these woods. It is, or was, known as St Helen's Well, but there's no documentary evidence to support its existence. From the wood you can see the home ground of Pocklington Town Football Club, who compete in the Humber Premier League, which they've been champions of in the past. The other end of the wood brings us to the car park of Burnby Hall Gardens. These magnificent gardens have been referred to in the past as the jewel in Yorkshire's crown. They have a national collection of over 80 varieties of hardy water lilies, which bloom on two lakes between June and August. There's also a museum here which houses artefacts collected by Major Percy Stewart, an adventurer and traveller who owned Burnby Hall and made eight world tours between 1906 and 1926. The gardens are the result of decades of continuous work 
by the Stewart's Trust. So apparently the rest of the TVI tribe are in this Oxfam shop. Let's go and find them. Find them I did and we'll see what they bought later. Now let's talk buses. Pocklington is served by a number of bus routes provided by East Yorkshire Motor Services. Their X46 and X47 East Rider routes operate hourly through the town between York and Hull. The company have a depot in the town centre. Bus services in Pocklington began with a company called Everingham's, who started in the town as a tailor's. They ran a service from York to Pocklington, and the town's first ever public bus looked like this, quite different to the modern beasts. Next door to the bus station we have the fire station. This was established in 1966 and it houses two fire engines. It's crewed by on-call firefighters. It serves both the town and the surrounding areas of the East Riding of Yorkshire, including Full Sutton Prison. Over the road we have the old railway station, which was designed by George Townsend Andrews. This was saved from demolition due to its interesting architecture and part of it now serves as a bus shelter. However, every year Pocklington Station also has another function. It becomes a music venue. Even though Pocklington Station was closed as a result of the Beeching Report in 1965, it's done far more than just sit empty. Platform Festival, which is organised by the Pocklington Arts Centre, takes place within it. These photos are from the 2017 edition, which myself and Nikki both attended. It was headlined that year by Katie Tunstall, but it also featured Hampshire songstresses Ward Thomas and the super-talented Newton Faulkner of Dream Catch Me fame. As well as those, other past performers have included Lucinda Williams, The Levelers, Bellowhead, The Magic Numbers, Mary Chapin Carpenter and Richard Hawley. It's also been a springboard for many local bands and artists in the York area, who are championed here too. The event has sold out every single year after being launched in 2015. It generates a unique and intimate festival atmosphere. And trust me, intimate is accurate. It can get really, really hot in the old station. After all, it was a building that was erected in 1847 and it's made of solid brick. At that time, air conditioning wasn't even thought of. But then again, aren't festivals designed to be sweaty things anyway? Behind the station you'll find not just one, but two big supermarkets. Pocklington has a branch of Sainsbury's and a brand new Aldi store in close proximity. Despite the existence of these, Pocklington's market and thriving town centre still attract thousands of people. The Aldi store, which covers around 1,300 square metres, stands on the site of the former North Wolds printer's business, and its car park is where Bond's garage used to be. When it was built, it initially created 15 new jobs for the town. Now we come to the town's burial ground, which you can walk the entire length of via Cemetery Lane. At this end, it's marked by two gorgeous Victorian chapels, one which originally would have been for the Anglicans and the other for dissenters. There are hundreds of graves in here, some of which are very interesting and tell some rather sad stories. The cemetery contains the graves of 12 World War II servicemen, most of whom were in the RAF and were stationed at the former RAF Pocklington. There are also three World War I casualties buried in here too. The path through the cemetery emerges onto Amos Drive, a housing estate built in 2014. As part of the development, this building was erected. It's a health centre which contains the Pocklington Group Practice, the main surgery in the town. 
Pocklington Beck runs behind this building and we cross it again towards West Green. Note the sign here, it's pointing towards the Anand VC Cadet Centre, which forms part of the nearby Pocklington School. Between the two is West Green itself, a sizeable playing field and playground. Our last landmark is Pocklington School itself, the 67th oldest school in the UK. A private day and boarding school, it was founded in 1514 by John Dolman. Its motto, Virtute et Veritate, is Latin for With Courage and Truth. Actor Adrian Edmondson and tennis player Kyle Edmund are among a huge list of notable alumni. The most famous was the anti-slavery campaigner William Wilberforce. He attended between 1771 and 1776, and there's a bronze statue of him outside the school's entrance, which was made by Sally Arnup of York. Okay, so we're all the way around Pocklington. Review, people? We did lots of shopping. Lots of shopping. In fact, Lauren, you bought something in particular, didn't you? Yep. We took a picture of her in this, in this thing. We got it from a charity shop. Not the Oxfam shop, but a, a different one. Which one was it from? Uh, no, uh, St. St. Leonard's. St. Leonard's. Here's a picture of Lauren in the item of clothing in question. And you're all going to be wowed by this, I'm sure. Well, in fact, we can do a little bit better than a picture, can't we, Lauren? Because we're back home now and we've got this garment on, haven't we? Yep. Shall we wow everybody with this? Yeah. Okay, here we go then. Ignore the cat food in the corner. Yeah, ignore the cat food, people. How about that? Give us a twirl, missus. <laughs> not bad, not bad. There it is. Blue and purple prom dress. Purple. Purple, indeed. Purple. Purple. <laughs> Looks fabulous, don't you? Absolutely. It just goes to show that you don't need to go into the big sort of department stores and you know all expensive you know designer clothing outlets to find a dress like this. You can just go to a charity shop in a small town it in East Yorkshire. All boxes. <laughs> it certainly does. And Lauren, if I do if I do say so myself, you look absolutely amazing. Stunning. I'm sure everybody's going to agree with you with us. And there you have it. The town of Pocklington is behind us. Don't forget, a lot of the town's other major landmarks don't fall within the boundaries. The best example is the RAF base, which is of course Barnby Moor. But then again, all of Pocklington's neighbours have already been covered, so it truly is complete now. So too is the entire western side of the East Riding. With only 28 to go in the county, next week we'll be heading back south as we take on the last two on the Humber Estuary. See you later everyone! Thanks for watching this video folks, don't forget to like this episode if you haven't already, it really makes a difference with YouTube. If you're new here, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this and give us a share too if you've got friends who'd like it. You can find all the links to my social media accounts below as well as my buy me a coffee page where you can donate to the channel. Also if you've enjoyed this episode, have a look at some more videos in this series. Until next time, I've been Andy, also known as the Village Idiot, and I'm out.